the hour. Thank you. This portion of the service now, I want to introduce to you our speaker. Those of you who by, who are listening by tape throughout the country and throughout the world. Now, this is one of our deacons, Brother John Floyd. God has also called him as a lay teacher, lay preacher. He has a message on his heart from the Word, and this is the time, and I just feel that it's it's a time of great uh, enjoyment for me as pastor and hopefully for you to, to sit and listen to what God has placed upon his heart. Brother John, would you come forward at this time? I'll do the invitation. All right. Thanks, Gary. Well, it's great to be back up here again. It's been a couple of months. Um, I usually do this on when you guys are on vacation or something, but uh, it's good to be here. So. I'm not going to take a lot of time with the uh, uh, intro, so I wanted to go ahead and get started here. I guess if I had to give a title to the sermon, it would be called Christian Endurance. And what we're going to be looking at today is uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 17. So if you want to go ahead and uh, turn to that, please do. <coughs> chapter 12 of Hebrews illustrates the endurance expected of the believer by God. Uh, Jesus Christ is going to be set forth, you'll see as we go through the chapter, as our supreme example of, of endurance and how we are to endure through the Christian life. Um, the author of Hebrews just completed chapter 11, which most of you all know is uh, sometimes called the Hall of Faith. And uh, we're going to see there as well um, an exhortation for us to follow the example of some of the great believers uh, that we see in the Old Testament. Uh, by way of background, Chapter 11 began by defining faith as the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So that we're, told to, uh, we're told that by faith the men of old gained approval. So again, we, had, we need to begin to understand now as we set forth uh, this message today that, that uh, what we're really talking about is faith. And faith is a key part, and is an integral part if we're to ever please God. So we need to think about how do we walk by faith and not walk by sight? Um, one of the things to note in chapter 11 of Hebrews, we're not going to read through that because of time, but if you, if you notice, almost every verse begins by, with the phrase, by faith, by faith, by faith. Everything these folks did in the Old Testament that gained this great approval of God was done by faith. Um, those mentioned in the Hall of Faith were said to have died in faith without receiving the promises. Uh, the promises there refers to the inheritance. Uh, these great people of the faith were seeking a better country from where they went out. Um, they knew that God had a new citizenship for them, one in which uh, was not the land that they came from. And in the same way, that's a perspective we need to have today as Christians. And that is, is that while we're here in the United States, wherever we're from, and we have an earthly citizenship, the fact of the matter is, is that once you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have a new citizenship, and that is a heavenly citizenship, and that is really the focus that we need to have. So what we found then when we looked at uh, Hebrews ch chapter 11, for example, in verse 16, is that um, these folks were, uh, it says in verse 16, but as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And what the interesting thing about that verse is that it really what it does is it implies that had they really sought to go back to their home country and forsake what God had uh, set out, set apart for them, it implies that God would have been ashamed of them to be called their God. Now, they would be saved, of course, and once you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can never lose that. But as a child of God, you can do certain things in which would cause the Father quote unquote, to be ashamed of the way um, that you're acting. So the interesting thing is, is that um, God was proud of them in the sense that um, they left their home country, they want to do his will, and therefore he was proud of that. So chapter 11 closes by restating the fact that these individuals gained approval through their faith, but did not receive what was promised. And the reason for that is, is that God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they could not be made perfect. So this kind of brings us to chapter 12, which is really the focus of the message this morning. Um, and all of this background is intended to set up what we're going to be talking about 
And really what I've done is divided uh, the message into three sections. Uh, section number one, it talks about the ultimate endurance, which is illustrated by Christ, and that's in verses one through three. And that's really where we're going to spend most of our time this morning. Uh, the second point then will be the value of discipline in endurance training. That is verses four through 13. And we'll just briefly touch on that because of time. And then what I'll do is wrap up with point number three, which is the consequences of giving up your birthright, which is verses 14 through 17. So then beginning with point number one, which is the ultimate endurance illustrated by Christ, uh, let's look at uh, chapter 12, beginning in verse one. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So verse 1 begins with the word therefore, which, is, which connects it to the preceding uh, text of chapter 11. Uh, the great cloud of witnesses that surrounds us refers to those great believers found in the hall of faith. In verse 1 we find <clears throat> two commands for the Christian. Command number 1 is to lay aside every encumbrance. And number two, the second command in, in verse one that we'll look at is that we're to lay aside the sin which so easily entangles us. So beginning with command number one in verse number one, uh, just as the believers in chapter 11, where we talked about the great hall of faith and those folks, just as they laid aside every encumbrance or every hindrance uh, and that they walk by faith, so we too are exhorted to do the very same thing. These individuals are said to be witnesses. That is, uh, they were faithful to God in their lives and their actions proved the worth of their faith. We are also told in verse 1 that just as the believers described in chapter 11 were faithful, so we too should walk in faith as they have. We should follow in their footsteps, using them as an example of how to live our lives. And so just as they laid aside everything that would hinder them from pleasing God, were to do the same. The word laid aside here uh, really refers to the point that we need to make the decision at a point in time just to say, whenever anything pops up within our lives that could pull us away from the will of God, we need to put that aside. We need to make a decision and say, this is hindering my Christian growth and I need to consciously say, I'm not gonna do this anymore. Or I'm going to uh, you know, make a change in the way my life is, is going right now. Uh, the word encumbrance here uh, simply refers to anything that serves to hinder or prevent someone from doing something. So um, I guess the key point here is that, you know, a lot of times we think about things that hinder our Christian walk and, uh, you know, many times it's the, the big sins that come up and that uh, we think about that are so bad. But, you know, really one of the things that this word points out here is that um, it doesn't really matter what it is that may be pulling you away from God. You know, so, so many times, at least in my life, it's the very, very subtle and, and things that are innocent in and of themselves that would pull me away from doing exactly what God would have me to do. So don't think of it as always being a sin uh, which entangles you, but it could be an innocent activity um, that just over time kind of pulls you away from possibly the study of God's word. And that in and of itself over time can become a sin because it's taking your attention away from the Word of God. So we're to lay aside every encumbrance, anything that would pull you away from doing God's will in your life. Now the second command uh, we find in verse 1 is that we're to lay aside the sin which so easily entangles us. Now the author here is speaking of a specific sin because of the fact that he uses the definite article before the word sin. So it's up to us now to figure out, well, what is that sin? And I believe based on the context and based on uh, chapter 11, which speaks of, of you know, keeping the faith, I believe that the sin which so easily entangles all of us is lack of faith. And of course, the result, the result of lack of faith would be kind of giving up the race, which we'll talk about uh, in a few minutes here. So he's describing a, a particular sin, a sin of lack of faith. And... Um, what we have, I think when we compare uh, what he's saying to verse 11, where we see that these wonderful believers of the Old Testament um, kept the faith and they endured through hardship, through suffering, through pain, and in the end, um, they gained God's approval through their faith, which it says in chapter 11, verse 39. It's also interesting to note, if you look back at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, 
And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. You know, one of the things I thought was interesting about this verse was the fact that the author connects faith with rewards in, uh, in verse 6 there of chapter 11. And, you know, this is really in line with the overall theme of the book of Hebrews, which is inheritance for the believer. As believers in Jesus Christ, we have an opportunity to receive a great inheritance in Christ's coming kingdom. Uh, and waiting for us right now is that inheritance uh, that includes, includes the privileges of ruling and reigning, reigning with our Savior. But as Hebrews continually warns, and as many of you all remember from when we went through Hebrews in our Sunday school lessons, um, while we have this wonderful inheritance awaiting us, we also have the potential of forfeiting that inheritance through disobedience and through lack of faith when, is what it really comes down to while we're here on earth. So you can never lose your salvation. You can never lose the gift of heaven, but you can lose the wonderful inheritance that God has waiting for us uh, in his kingdom. So if we allow the things of the world to become an encumbrance or a hindrance to a life of faith, will not rule and reign with Jesus Christ, we'll forfeit that inheritance. And at the end of our lives, we're not going to hear the wonderful words, well done, thou good and faithful servants. You know, it's so easy again, as I mentioned before, just to let the innocent things in life uh, get in the way of, you know, a life of faith. Um, and many times, these, you know, these take different forms for all people. It could be money, it could be uh, a very active social life, which seems innocent. But if there's something in your life that keeps you from getting up early and studying the Word of God or staying up late and studying the Word of God or if you don't work it's uh, studying in the middle of the day because of soap opera or whatever the, whatever the case may be then that can become uh, an encumbrance or a hindrance uh, and that can be that's something that we need to deal with so verse 1 then if you look back at chapter 12 concludes by, exhort, by exhorting us to run the race with endurance that is set before us now the word run here is a present active subjunctive in the Greek and, and really what that means is um, there's never a time when you're a Christian, once you believed in Jesus Christ, that you are to stop running the race. Present tense means you are to continually run. As long as you have trusted in Christ and you're alive on this earth, you are in the race and you are called to run that race. The active uh, voice means that you're the one that has to do it. Nobody's going to do it for you. And what I thought was interesting here is that the author of Hebrews put this in what's called the subjunctive mood. And the subjunctive mood in the Greek denotes potential. And what he's saying here is that um, maybe you will, maybe you won't. But you've got the command from the Lord that you need to run the race and you need to run it to win. But the uh, author also had the, uh, the uh, insight to understand and to know that some people are going to make a decision not to do that. So there's potential there, but it is up to us to make that decision. So we're to run the race with endurance. And again, the word uh, endurance here really means uh, what it says, endurance. The word also means patience. Because a lot of times you think about um, the trials and struggles that we all go through. And many times, one of the hardest things for us to do is to wait. And it may not seem uh, on the onset to be something like a great, uh, you know, wonderful or difficult trial. Things that we hear about people going through in other countries today or in the Old Testament. But uh, running the race with endurance includes being patient. And what that means sometimes is sitting back and doing nothing and let God do all the work. And you just wait on the Lord. So it can take many different forms running the race. It's not, uh, you know, the word seems to always imply when we think of run is, you know, strong, hard, physical effort. But it really, what it comes down to is it's a mental battle. And we've got to get it right mentally first. And then from there, based on right thinking, do the right thing. So having this endurance in the Christian life is all important. Um, turn with me, if you will, to James chapter 1. And I want to take a look at verses 2 through 4. You know, many of us are familiar with these verses. Um, but the reason I bring these out, is, the reason I bring this out is that the same word for endurance is found twice in this passage as well. So I think it's pertinent to our study this morning. Uh, 2 through 4 says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So here again we see that endurance 
uh, is a key part of the Christian life. And here we find that endurance in the Christian life has a perfect result within our lives. And that result is that it makes the believer perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The Greek word perfect here, teleos, is understood by most to mean mature. So what he's talking about here is Christian maturity when he talks about being complete. Because as you know, we're never going to be totally perfect while we're here on this earth, but we should be getting better and better each day in terms of uh, doing the Lord's will. So he's talking about being mature here when he talks about being perfect. Uh, we also find in, in uh, James here, chapter 1, that endurance also makes the Christian complete. And I thought this was an interesting word. I went to uh, kind of dig it out a little bit. And uh, what, it, what the word complete means here is really refers to totality and um, it has special emphasis on the entity as a whole. And of course, the entity here is the Christian. And what he's saying here is that the entire Christian, your entire self, your body, soul, and spirit um, <coughs> It becomes completed in a sense when you endure through the Christian life. So um, I think the thought that was interesting how he brought out the fact that, again, it's, you know, it's all three parts of us. You know, we're trichotomous beings. We're body, soul, and spirit. And uh, endurance in the Christian life has a positive impact on all aspects of our being. Uh, you know, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Now may the God of peace sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when we stand before Jesus Christ to be judged as Christians, he's going to judge our whole being. And he expects that our body, soul, and spirit be found blameless and preserved complete. Each of us must be sanctified, uh, that is, set apart to do God's will. Uh, you know, 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says that we are to abstain from every form of evil. So anything that would have a negative impact on your body, soul, and spirit, we're to abstain from. We're to moment by moment confess our sins. Anytime we do anything that's wrong, any sin, at that moment we should be confessing that, not waiting to the end of the day or not uh, you know, waiting to the end of the week and go to a priest. But you know, we have our great high priest who's in heaven right now at the right hand of the Father. And at the moment we, can, we sin, we need to confess that, as Gary talked about this morning with 1 John 1, 9. Secondly, uh, we're to study our Bible daily. And this is really food for the soul. This is the part where we begin to have the sanctification or the setting apart or the saving of the soul through the daily intake of the Word of God. And what that does, as you all know, this Bible study is literally what transforms you from the inside and develops right thinking within you. And then, based upon that right thinking, what we need to do is um, have right uh, actions. And there, and there is where the sanctification or the setting apart of the body comes into play when we think of it from a, a present tense point of view while we're alive, or while we're here alive on the earth. Also found that uh, as Paul was writing First uh, Thessalonians 5:23. He wrote it in what's called the optative mood. And when what that means is, is that uh, the optative mood expresses a wish or a desire. And what he was saying here is that his strong desire or wish was that these uh, folks uh, in Thessalonica would be found uh, complete, preserved uh, complete, without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ at his judgment seat. And that same uh, thinking goes for us today, too is that when we reach the judgment seat of Christ, we need to ensure that we have lived our lives uh, accordingly and we have run the race to win. Uh, Paul again uh, talks about the importance of becoming a mature Christian uh, in Ephesians 4, 13 through 15, but you may want to write that down. I know we're kind of run, running short on time, so we won't look that one up. But to summarize verse 1 then, Christians are to put aside any activity uh, that impedes their spiritual growth uh, whatever's getting in the way of our Bible study, our prayer time, our living right needs to be put aside. Uh, we need to follow the example of those in the Hall of Faith of chapter 11, and we need to ensure that we're not entangled by anything uh, that the world has to offer. Otherwise, we can be disqualified uh, for the wonderful inheritance that awaits us. Okay, now moving on to verse number 2 of chapter 12. Fixing our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, 
and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So, you know, just as a runner uh, fixes his eyes on the goal, which is the finish line, uh, Christians are to fix their eyes on something as well. And we're to fix our eyes upon Jesus Christ, who is the leader or author and perfecter of our faith. So he's the one that should be in our sights. Just like uh, an individual who trains for the Olympics, they have the goal in mind to win the race. Well, we too are in a race, but it's a spiritual race. And we need to have our eyes fixed upon Jesus Christ, who is the one who can bring uh, the faith to us that we need. Uh, to fix our eyes on Jesus means, uh, the word literally means to look away from something and, and turn to another thing. And that other thing, of course, is Jesus Christ. Uh, the word also means to concentrate the gaze upon, it means to keep thinking about uh, without having one's attention distracted. In other words, we are to turn away from anything that will distract us from following Jesus Christ. We are to concentrate on him and his word. We are to be occupied with Christ, for he is the author and perfecter of our faith. The word author in the Greek is archagos, and what that uh, means is leader or ruler or prince or originator, depending on the context. The word is used in three other places within the New Testament. Uh, one where Christ is called the author of life, another where he's called the prince and savior, and also in uh, Hebrews 2.10 where he's called the author of their salvation. And it was interesting, I found out this week studying for this, that in the ancient world, the Archagos was the leader of the city. He was the um, one that was always out in front. He was the hero of the city. Um, he was the city's defender. And if you think about it, that is exactly what Jesus Christ is to the Christian. He is our leader. He should be our hero. He should be um, the one that's out in front of us uh, in, instead of us being in front of him, so to speak. Um, and of course, apart from the leadership of Jesus Christ in our lives, uh, we will never realize the Christian maturity uh, and we will never hear again the, uh, the words from our Savior at the judgment seat that uh, you did a good job, that you walked by faith and not by sight, and you were a good servant of mine. So he needs to be our leader uh, in our lives. Uh, he's our supreme example of endurance, as verse 2 tells us as well. Um, and, you know, because of the joy that was set before him, that is his exaltation to the Father's right hand, and also uh, his inheritance of the kingdom of heaven, he, endure, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Uh, so Jesus Christ endured the cross, uh, he was patient. He stayed the course. Uh, you know, remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, he knew what the Father's will was. He knew what he wanted, but he knew that he had to defer to what God had ultimately brought him to this earth for. So what a wonderful example that we have. He, um, you know, he chose against the immediate gratification of, you know, getting the heck out of Dodge. And he said, I will do the Father's will. And in the same way, we need to have that mindset moment by moment, day by day, when we have uh, uh, trials, tribulations, or when we have great prosperity. You know, prosperity is one of the toughest trials in life. Whenever any of these things come to us, we need to ensure that we have our eyes upon the goal, upon the prize, upon the finish line. Because if we don't, it's going to be so easy for us to get sidetracked and not walk by faith, but begin to walk by sight. So we need to follow Christ's example of endurance. We need to follow his example of patience. And we need to go for the prize. Now in verse 3, it uh, says, For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. So verse 3 tells us that we are to consider Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the word consider here means to reason with uh, thoroughness and completeness. It means to think out carefully. Uh, it means to reason thoroughly, to consider careful, carefully. Um, what it's saying here is that we need to thoroughly uh, understand and we need to contemplate what and who Jesus Christ is and what he has done for us on the cross and what he has provided for us beyond the cross as well. And the reason that we need to do this is that we may not grow weary and lose heart. So this requires an understanding of Christ before you can ever begin to consider him. You need to know what you're considering. And again, that goes back to understanding the word of God. Without that understanding, 
Um, you can never truly consider, understand, contemplate, and apply the truths. For you know, it says in John 1, 14, that the word that the word became flesh. So Jesus Christ is the word incarnate and incarnate, and we need to understand him thoroughly. We need to consider him. So uh, if in fact um, we do consider Jesus Christ, it says here there's a great and wonderful result, and that is that we're not going to grow weary and we're not going to lose heart as we go through this lifetime. To lose heart means to become tired and weary within your soul uh, so as just to give out or to give up. Um, it can be described as fainting of the soul uh, from spiritual exhaust exhaustion. And, you know, I thought about it, it could be likened to uh, a runner. And I don't know if any of y'all have ever used to run or anything. I used to, but, you know, if you sit around for uh, 10 years and then you want to go back out and run a marathon and you're trying to keep up with the pack, well, after about the first mile, you're just going to give out with exhaustion. And that's what would happen to me if I went out and tried to do that right now. Well, it's the same way in the spiritual race. And that is, if we are to run the race to win, we need to be in shape. We need to be trained. We need to be disciplined. And if we're not, we will grow weary and lose heart. And the way to avoid that, again, this verse tells us, is that we need to consider Jesus Christ. We need to understand him. We need to contemplate. We need to meditate under... Uh, on his word and then take those truths and apply them to our lives. Uh, this apparently was one of the problems with the uh, Hebrew Christians that our author had written to uh, in the book of Hebrews. Apparently they were uh, on the verge of giving up what they had and in danger of losing the inheritance that God had for them. Uh, and just as it was then, so it is today. If we give up in the race, if we decide to quit, if we throw in a towel, then we will lose the inheritance. We won't gain all the wonderful rewards and blessings uh, that God has for us. You'll get to heaven, but you're going to miss out on the wonderful things that are waiting for us in the kingdom of heaven. So um, we need to consider Jesus Christ. We need to understand him, and we need to put him first in our lives. We're placed in a race once we accept Jesus Christ. You know, as a Christian, being in the race is an optional. You can't uh, accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and then say, um, I decide not to be a part of the race. I'm just going to never, uh, you know, get on my running shoes and go at it. Um, you know, 1 Corinthians 9.24 says that, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. So we're all in a race, and we're all exhorted and commanded to run in such a way that we may win. And there's no way you can ever win the race without training. And you've got to train to be in shape to do it. Paul gives, a, gives the Galatians a, a similar command in Galatians 6, 9, where he says, And let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we shall reap if we do not grow weary. So we've got to fight the good fight and not give up ever. All right, so in verses 1 through 3, we are exhorted to lay aside anything that would prevent us from growing into maturity as Christians and running, the endurance, running with endurance the Christian race. Uh, the author of Hebrews tells us that we must have faith just as the Old Testament saints had faith. We are also told that the way to accomplish this is by concentrating on the Word of God. Now in verses 4 through 13, what we see is the value of discipline and endurance training. Uh, verses 4 through 13, the author describes the importance of our endurance training. Um, beginning in verse 4, I'm going to read through uh, a couple of verses here and then just give a summary of it. Uh, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons, for what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have, all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Now, that's as far as I'm going to read right now. But, you know, the discipline spoken of here is that of child training or child rearing. Uh, in verses 5 through 6, the Greek word for discipline is padua, which means literally to train a child. So what we're talking about here is that type of training in which a father gives a son or a daughter to bring them up, to raise them, to bring them to maturity. You know, many times people ask why Christians suffer, 
And again, one of the reasons for Christian suffering is for our own training, to grow us and to bring us to maturity. Uh, verse 6 says, For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. So we don't always know why we may suffer, um, but we know that we're going to suffer as Christians. And there are several different reasons why believers suffer. Um, there are probably some seven reasons within the Bible that I can find um, in which believers may suffer. And I just wanted to run through these quickly, just as a top line, just to kind of remind us of the different reasons that we may encounter suffering or trials or tribulations within our, within our lives. Uh, point number one is that uh, we suffer because of our own poor choices. Uh, 1 Peter 2.20 says, For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? So, you know, many times uh, the reason we're going through problems or having hard times is because of poor choices that we've made during our lifetime. Uh, point number two, we suffer for taking a stand for truth and righteousness. You know, First Peter 3.14 says, But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed, and do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled. Number three, we suffer for sin in our lives. First uh, Corinthians 11.31 says, But if we judged ourselves rightly, we should not be judged. So the point there is, is that if we continually confess our sins and take care of them with God, then they're taken care of. But if we don't, you know, we have uh, the potential there to have some discipline for that. Number four, we suffer for our past sins. Uh, Galatians 6, 7, Do not be, be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. The point of this verse is, is that... Um, your sins may be forgiven, but many times some of the things that we've done in the past can have a lasting negative impact on us. You know, for example, uh, you know, alcoholism, you can be saved and be freed from alcoholism, but that not, won't necessarily uh, heal your stomach. So there's many times we pay for the sins of our past. Number five, we may suffer for a lofty reason that may not even be revealed to us. And this makes me think about Job. Uh, remember what happened to Job. God said um, to Satan, I'm going to show you that even if a person loses all that he or she has, um, they will not necessarily turn away from me. They will still choose good over evil. And then number six, we suffer for our faith. You know, Hebrews 11 is a wonderful example of that, um, where we see you know, there's wonderful blessings for uh um, for following God, but then there's also some, some consequences. And as you recall, many of the folks in the Old Testament uh, were killed because of the faith. Some were stoned, some were sawn in two, and so on. So there's that as well. And then finally, number seven, which is the topic of our uh, passage here, is that we suffer for discipline. And Hebrews 12, again, teaches us that we may suffer for the purposes of child training or child rearing from God. And I think the thing that we need to remember here is that you're never too old, I'm never too old to receive this type of training from God. We never will reach a point in our lives where we've become uh, mature enough or, or we're old enough to know better and that God will not you know, uh, work with us in, in such a manner. So he's always there and as long as we're here on this earth, that will be a part of our lives. Okay, that was a quick summary of uh, the second section. wanted to just to end up real quick on verses 14 through 17, which talk about the consequences of giving up our birthright. Uh, beginning in verse 14, says, pursue, pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled, that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards when he desired, desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. So here we have some Old Testament typology or example. And God is bringing up the example of Esau to us here to teach us that we as believers who have a birthright or inheritance waiting for us also have the potential of losing that or forfeiting that uh, birthright if we do not um, uh, value that birthright and if we do not live accordingly while we're here on this earth. You know, it was interesting to note that Esau gave up his birthright for a meal. And you know, think about that today, you know, how does that apply to believers today? When I think about that, what I think about is, um, you know, we go through this life with choices and with opportunities. 
and we can either say, you know, I believe what God has for me is the very best thing, and I'm going to uh, persevere, and I'm going to endure, and I'm going to receive that birthright when I get to heaven, and I'm going to hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Or what we can say is, um, you know, I did, I've decided to trade that birthright uh, for what I can get on this earth right now. So I've decided to uh, do these things that take time away from following the Word of God or reading and studying the Word of God. And again, these are such subtle things many times that we don't really realize get in the way. But in the end, um, you know, we have the warning here, and we understand that if we do not walk by faith, and if we do walk by sight, um, we do have that chance of, of losing the uh, inheritance or the birthright. You know that Esau, afterwards, um, he realized what he had given up. And it says in the Bible here that he sought for it with tears, but he found no repentance. And what it's saying here is that, uh, you know, there comes a point in time when it's too late. And when we reach the judgment seat of Christ and we realize what we have given up, it'll be too late to do anything about it. And so Esau serves as a wonderful example for us today that uh, while we're here alive and kicking, we need to be diligent. We need to run with endurance the race that is set before us. Because once we get to the judgment seat of Christ, uh, Jesus Christ is not going to have any repentance. And, and the word repentance here just literally means he's not going to change his mind. He is not going to change the way he thinks about um, the way that you lived your life. And there will be no turning back at that point in time. So, there's the possibility of being disapproved for the, uh, for the inheritance. But the wonderful news is, is that uh, we have the opportunity to live our lives by faith. Uh, you know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So it's through the study of scriptures and the application of that that we build our faith. And we have that opportunity for us today. It's never too late to start, uh, but we need to keep doing that. We need to run the race with endurance. Uh, I guess in closing, you know, we see that uh, many wonderful, strong, great believers uh, preceded us. And we learned that and uh, saw that example in chapter 11 that I just briefly touched on. We also found that Christ uh, serves as our supreme example. We need to consider Christ. We need to contemplate him. We need to understand him in his word. And if we do that, we're promised a result. And that result is that we will not grow weary. We will not give up. We will not throw in the towel and just uh, lose the race. So we need to keep our eyes fixed on him. We need to make sure that nothing else gets in our way, distracts us from, from keeping our eyes on him. And in the end, uh, he who is the author and perfecter of our faith will um, see to it that we gain a wonderful reward and inheritance uh, in the kingdom of heaven. So that was kind of a quick one on chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 17. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions afterwards, but uh, um, there we have it. I think it's a great message for us just to, to, to remind us that we need to keep on keeping on. Don't give up. And in those moments of silence when we make that decision, we need to consider Jesus Christ and then choose what the right thing is and the right way to think. So uh, with that, Gary, I am finished. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing, John. He ministered unto me. I hope he did to you too. That was great. And uh, uh, as the old old farmer preacher used to say, he 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 gave us a load of hay. <laughs> All at once. That's good. Well, uh, we're going to now have invitation, and uh, let me just put it like this: If there's someone here that has never trusted Christ. But as you're sitting in your seat, you can just simply let go and let God. You do that by just simply saying in your prayer, I trust Jesus as Savior. You see, salvation is the simplest thing in the world. It is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. He died for you on the cross. In the very moment that you believe, God says you have eternal life. But then he has one of these secret disciples. I mean, you can trust in him and go to heaven, but you can't get any rewards if you try to be a secret disciple. He wants you to stand up. If you're going to follow him, you need to follow him in public. 
That's why we kind of ask you to come forward, just to come out and maybe take me by the hand by that action you be saved to the whole world. From now on, I'm going to be public about this. I'm going to trust you, follow you. And so that's the invitation to you this morning. If you're here also, you may perhaps want to join our church. It's open for you to come forward to join the church. All we only we ask is that if you have a, that you must trust Jesus as your Savior. Number two, that you must have been baptized. If you haven't been baptized, we will baptize you. And if for any other reason you feel that your baptism isn't correct, perhaps you've been saved many, many years back. And you want to get to make sure that's right. Because, you know, that's necessary for the kingdom. Because that, God, that's one of the commandments that God has asked us to do. To trust Him, not only trust Him, but publicly show that death, burial, and resurrection in Christ. The war baptism. So that will be the threefold invitation this morning. Let's take our hymn books, turn to 125. Jesus paid it all. We'll all stand and we'll all sing together. And the invitation is open to you. Amen. Amen.